morning, everyone. I just want to clarify expectations with what I'm going to say in the next 20 or 25 minutes. Um, I'll be talking about the beginnings of the ADA and the antecedent events in the first couple of years. I won't be counting in each of the 20 years um, that we've been in operation. Um, in some ways, it's quite a personal reflection, and here and there, I may be a little blunt. So let me start by making a very basic initial remark. All events in human activities, all decisions have their origin in preceding activity and circumstances. Indeed, it's impossible to understand ourselves and our individual and collective histories without acknowledging this essential fact. Fundamental to many of the deeper debates about what copyright actually represents is also a recognition of this fact that essentially none of us is a sole inventor de novo of the artefact that we bring into being. None of our creators actually operate in a void at a level of individual instances of solitary creationism, as it were. A major work such as Handel's Messiah owed its composition not only to the preceding centuries of the craft of music making and musical imagination, but in many cases to the composer's own preceding and more fragmented musical structures and melodies and that of their contemporaries. So it's important to understand that the origin of the ADA is firm, firmly rooted in the events of the 1990s, and in particular the way that the net and the layers of activity built on the net came to influence everything, including business behaviour and lawmaking. In its early phases, it heralded the rapid development of small enterprising communities experiencing their first stimulating right taste of completely new ways of rapidly exchanging and disseminating ideas, views and expression with excitement and imagination powering along our new internet citizens who saw themselves at a new frontier, epitomised perhaps by grateful dead musician and Midwest rancher John Perry Barlow. But in others, especially those whose business had been the control of content and the channels for conveying content in traditional ways, it started a panic. And for those for whom the definition of business success was dependent on maintaining content and channel control with the attendant harvesting of benefit, the moment had arrived to act with both force and hyperbole. But just to backtrack for a minute, to the 80s. The 80s was a decade of many changes, the rise of Reagan and Thatcher, the counterpoint of Glasnost and Perestroika and Gorbachev capped off by 1989 by the extraordinary events in Europe, the biggest changes since the end of the Second World War. In Australia, it was the time of the, he of the Hawke Keating ascendancy, structural reform, but also with a counterpoint of new giant corporate power the Bonds, the Packers, and so on. Some here may recall there was also a decade in Australia of summits. One such in the bicentenary year was the Australian Library Summit. One of its features was a discussion of shared concerns about the way copyright policy was trending. For by this time, it had become clear that libraries, which had hitherto been regarded and certainly regarded themselves, as the very essence of orderly and lawful conduct in the carrying out of their missions were under a strange new attack. Launched by the Copyright Agency, this attack took the form of lobbying government to repeal the exceptions in the Copyright Act that provided for libraries to conduct certain services on behalf of users as legally recognised exceptions. I refer particularly here to interlibrary loans and to copying on behalf of remote users in the context of distance education, both of which provisions had developed in the context of Australia's distinctive characteristics as a sparsely populated country with real limitations in library provision. The Library Summit was supported by a range of organisations, including the National Library and the then Australian Council of Libraries and Information Services, known as ACLIS, and its concerns ranged across a number of areas as well as copyright. 
As the internet grew in the next few years from 91 to 93, and remembering that this is also pre-World Wide Web time, both excitement and apprehension grew. By 1994, it had become evident that more concerted action would be needed to defend the public interest in our collecting institutions. That is, more than the occasional meeting or conference. So it was that the Australian Council of Libraries established definite action on copyright, firstly establishing a, nat a national cross-sectoral body, and by cross-sectoral here I mean different groups of different kinds of libraries, and that was called the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee. And secondly, and importantly, deciding to commit to the employment of a full-time person to pursue legal advocacy and public policy positions and submissions. The initial thinking about this position considered a choice between a library professional specialist or a person with legal training, most likely an early year graduate, as best fit for the role. And when we started a young law graduate from the University of Melbourne, it soon became evident that this indeed would meet the aspiration to develop a more articulate, dedicated and expert voice in the copyright arena. This initial occupant of the role was Jamie Wodetsky. Now, at this time, the mid-90s onwards, the Director General of the National Library, Warren Horton, which is where the Copyright Advocacy and ACLIS was housed, was on the board of the International Federation of Library Associations, or IFLA. This corresponded with the period in which planning was occurring for a profoundly important set of meetings in Geneva an event that was titled the WIPO Diplomatic Conference on Certain Copyright and Neighbouring Rights Questions, or the WIPO Copyright Treaty for short. Director General Warren Horton was, to his great credit, able to have Jamie Wodetsky present as an observer, and as such, at least one important link was made, to which I'll return shortly. There's one very important international context well, several important contexts, but one I want to choose here for the WIPO meetings. Many leading innovations in the development of the internet were occurring in the United States. And this included the rapid development of new and successful business models. But the US, as we all know here, was also by then home to a mature practice and doctrine of fair use in the observance of copyright. Its institutions, were and are also home to many leading intellectuals in law schools and elsewhere who were becoming increasingly engaged in the issues being thrown up by previously unknown ways of communicating content. This legal academic activism was an interesting counterpoint to the policy directions sought by the official US delegation to the WIPO conference led by USPTO's Bruce Learman. It was, of course, in the international strategic interest of the United States, as conventionally defined in terms of economic gain, to seek high levels of protection in international trade negotiations for intellectual property, and it has been ever since. It was completely effective in securing, along with allied interests in Europe and others, the fundamentals aligned to this view. By the time this outcome was clear, though, it was also true that the copyright debates within the, the states were very warm indeed. Indeed, with a threshold event having been the defeat of the Clinton administration's intent with its 1995 white paper, the aims of which had even included the idea of legislating that copyright rules of the road needed to be taught from kindergarten onwards. Spearheading the criticism of that Clinton white paper and with a broader critique generally of the direction of US copyright law making were several brilliant thinkers and writers, including Pam Samuelson. One of her many concerns as new issues arose was with the way that business owners would seek user agreement through increasingly artificial and inauthentic advices, devices such as new shrink wrap agreements, and the way that critics of these new developments could be picked off if they were seen to be defending a solitary sexual interest only for example, museums' interests, libraries' interests, and so on. 
At the same time, it had become evident that some of the critics of the direction being taken were also in Silicon Valley itself. Thus, the emergence of a new legal advocacy coalition, the Digital Futures Coalition, or DFC, based in Washington, D.C., seemed to be an interesting development. By 1996, some of its work was being widely reported. It so happened that I had the opportunity in January 1997 of a brief stop off in San Francisco on the way to something else to have a brief meeting with Pam Samuelson at Berkeley. When I mentioned that I'd been lobby working with lobbying and advocacy from a principally libraries perspective and was interested in broader cross sectoral uh, models such as the Digital Futures Coalition, she immediately wanted to know if I had met a particular lawyer called Peter Choi who was legal counsel working for Sun Microsystems. While still in town, with a few hours left, I made contact to discover that he was one of the links made by Jamie Wadetsky a few weeks before in Geneva, and was only too willing to discuss the idea of an Australian version of cross, a cross-sectoral broad-based coalition representing a viewpoint for more balanced copyright lawmaking. Peter's own story was instructive in the early 90s, his company was interested in developing more user-friendly user interfaces, or GUIs, to be deployed over Unix operating systems. At a certain point in pursuing this objective, he was charged with the responsibility of requesting agreement for the use of some simple icons, for example, the rubbish bin or trash can to represent the deletion of files, now being widely uh, recognised and deployed by um, Apple and Microsoft as their software products grew rapidly. When he wrote uh, requesting uh, what he thought would be a fairly straightforward permission, he was astonished at the vehemence of the heated rejection that he received from um, the first and then the second of these two giants. So he came to a dead end in this quest. He happened to mention this, by the way, in the lunchroom one day uh, in his company, where there were a couple of tech heads in the firm, and one of them said, but wait a minute, we developed that icon back in the day in Xerox Park, that is, before certain players there left to form new companies. So he had the idea then of writing to Xerox and seeking a royalty-free, perpetual, non-exclusive licence for the use of the relevant icons which he received. The lesson, as so often with copyright matters, was that the central issue was not so much who did the creating, but who in a position of commercial power had the appropriation of it. Or as Humpty Dumpty put it in Alice Through the Looking Glass, and I quote, the question is, which is to be master? That's all, end quote. The firm for which Peter worked became a supporter of the Digital Futures Coalition. Back in Australia, the idea that we would develop some, something similar, was discussed with a range of colleagues, including ACLIS uh, colleagues, and by 1998 had the support of enough organisations to attend an initial meeting uh, that was organised in July of 98. Now, by this time, the Australian Library's Copyright Committee had employed a new full-time officer, and that is its second, and that was Annabel Hurd. She was the main organiser in setting up the public discussion that was hosted by the National Library on the fourth floor of this building, and which agreed that something organisational should be done more adequately to more adequately represent a range of converging uh, viewpoints on this question of balance. By this time, the US had legislated the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, and the process of ratifying the treaties from Geneva included the notion that signatories would legislate their own forms of complying legislation, emulating to a greater or lesser degree what the US had already done. In Australia, the government was moving, and the need for a cross-sectoral advocacy of balance was stronger than ever. So it was agreed, after this meeting of July 98, to proceed with a small steering group that was charged with taking this further. It's critical to understand that a foundational idea in the establishment of the ADA was that industry, that is, organisations with a commercial focus, would be part of it. 
Not only was this the DFC model, but it was clear that to be successful, it would be better if any coalition of interests could readily establish that it was not just a collection of taxpayer-funded public institutions. This was a point often pursued by Pam Samuelson and others. Take a whole of law view. Don't just go for your own carve out representing your own sectoral body. It was worth noting that the Australian Consumers Association, the ACA, was quite active in the foundational arrangements, although this did not persist past the first couple of years. It's also worth noting that there was a lot at this stage happening, not just in terms of government reviews, but also negotiations between content owners and users. One of these that had significance and that was highlighted at the ADA's foundational meeting was the first offers by Cal on pricing for electronically available content provided in reliance on statutory license arrangements within our universities. It attracted the interest of the Australian Consumers Association, for example, that on one calculation, one way that the university sector could afford Cal's initial asking price would be to shut down three or, three or four of our smaller universities to pay the first year's annual bill. I should mention that by the end of 1998, an unrelated but necessarily intersecting development had taken place. That was the winding up of the parent organisation for the existing Australian Libraries Committee and the now embryonic ADA, that is the body called ACLIS. It's not relevant to this talk to go into why that occurred, but it did lead to an urgent requirement to gain cross-sectoral agreement for the continuing funding and hosting of the full-time policy and advocacy role, which, as the ADA formed, would be essential in the same way as it had been in acting on behalf of the library sector only. To the credit of the various bodies involved, uh, agreement was reached very quickly on that, and the absolutely minimalist infrastructure and office arrangements needed for the role to continue were assured. Following a further brief teleconference in December 98 of the steering group, arrangements were made for a public launch early the following year. This occurred in Parliament, the new Parliament House, on the 26th of February, with speakers including Dennis Pearce, the outgoing or soon to be outgoing chair of the Copyright Law Review Committee. Whether by coincidence or not, the federal government announced on that very day the release of its exposure draft of the Copyright Amendment Digital Agenda Bill. That is Australia's response to the WIPO Copyright Treaty. This was done under the joint auspices of Attorney General Williams and Communications Minister Alston. It was, however, to be some months before there was a first meeting of the Interim Board, chaired by industry-based Steve Heptonstall with the organisational arrangements made by Annabel Hurd who coincidentally finished up in the role very shortly afterwards. This meeting was held on the 16th of August, 99, and the interim board included education, library, industry, legal, and consumer organisations. By now, the intellectual property and competition review process had commenced with a small group, including Jill McHugh, chaired by Henry Ergas. The interim board meeting was in fact interrupted by the necessity of some of its members having to depart for a meeting at that very moment with the panel. But even before this, the ADA was making submissions to government. By 19th of March, 99, it had perfected its introductory explanation of itself thus. I quote, the ADA is a unique new coalition of public and private sector interests formed to promote balanced copyright law and provide an effective voice for a public interest perspective in the copyright debate. It has a ring of familiarity. Uh, although it took some months for the board to be more formally established, that is through being properly incorporated, and I acknowledge the work in passing here of Charles Alexander, the year 99 afforded no opportunity to rest. The ADA was involved in submissions to an enforcement inquiry in that year, as well as the competition review, responses to the digital agenda bill, and also the Copyright Law Review Committee was by then undertaking a reference on the jurisdiction of the Copyright Tribunal, and after that, the copyright and contract question. 
In short, by this year, the copyright law making arena was a full and crowded one, and it had its sharp and increasingly shrill edges. For instance, on the announcement of the exposure draft of the Digital Agenda Bill, a press release from contents, content owners was headlined, International Opinion Deplores Digital Copyright Bill. During the year 2000, much of the time was taken up with continuing submission work and the processes involved in incorporation. These were finalised and the first meeting of the properly constituted body was held in April 2001. Uh, there had been a process of confirming its membership and there were by now changes in both chair and executive officer, these roles being now taken up by Christine Page Hanafi and Nick Smith, respectively. In addition to the policy submissions, the months in 2001 and into 2002 were, also, were taken up with organisational matters, including interaction with its two patrons, Sir Anthony Mason and Mr Neville Roach. There were budget issues and audit issues also to be dealt with. And there was a fair bit of lobbying at the time of the 2001 federal election, although it wasn't a headline issue. At this stage, the Alliance had a membership of 22 members of whom five were individuals. I might mention one of the five individual members was De Derek Whitehead, uh, who was later to become fourth chair of the board. There was also evidence from the early minutes of quite a bit of internal discussion about how fully to support the idea of the adoption of fair use in Australia. That was what we might call a maturing debate. By this time, I was able to reflect uh, uh, on the board on one occasion that since its launch the ADA had established itself as one of the more prominent voices in copyright law reform. It had been particularly successful in getting the attention and the respect of government. And I said that because uh, at the time on the Copyright Law, copyright law Review Committee uh, I came to understand that it was a body that was accustomed to receiving highly partisan submissions. It expected that. If it opened up a policy question for public response, then that's what it would get. But I well remember the view of its members and its uh, chair at that time in their early appraisal of submissions, wanting to know what the ADA said about this or what the ADA said about that in the same way as they would want to know what the Law Council said uh, about a particular issue. That is, as a respected and dispassionate public interest advocate. These early years of success and impact are extraordinary, the more extraordinary to reflect, reflect on given the modesty of funding and the remuneration involved and the occasional fragility of the organisational arrangements. The ADA could never match the huge amounts expended on professional lobbying and ceaseless visits to Canberra that could be undertaken by powerful media publisher owner interests. Despite the observation that the politicians and administrators and bureaucrats themselves would grow tired of what might be characterised as the relentless harping, which was the tone of much of this lobbying. It nevertheless, year after year, may have had its effect, including, I fear, some defraying of that initial aura of respect for its dispassionate public interest stance. But these matters of perception are not easily managed or controlled, and I think the ADA will ultimately be judged by the quality of its work, which I think, looking back over the last two decades, has been distinguished. Finally, some acknowledgements. Uh, last, uh, last evening there was a function that some here attended where Derek acknowledged the um, extraordinary work of various board members. I'd like to also acknowledge the work of the, the chairs. There have been four. Um, Steve hepton Stall, Christine Page Hanafi, Jamie Wadetsky, while not in the role of executive officer, came back and chaired for a short time before moving on. And then Derek, I th by my calculation, has been chair for slightly more than half of the 20 years that we are acknowledging today. Also, without doubt, the diligence and intelligence of those who've served in the ADA executive role should be recognised and implauded, applauded in, in this year. And in doing so, I salute in turn the work of 11 people, Jamie Wadetsky, Annabel Hurd, Catherine Beard, Nick Smith, Miranda Lee, 
Sarah Walladen, Laura Symes, Matt Dawes, Ellen Broad, Trish Hepworth, and Jessica Katz. Most of these talented people have been in post for an average of two years, and in their individual ways, most have done the most remarkable things. Thank you for your attention.